Well, hello, everyone. I think we're live now. Uh, welcome to the Atlas Project, episode 19. Uh, I'm Ben Baer, and with me in New York is Greg Salmieri. Anyway, we're talking about part two, chapter nine of The Face Without Pain or Fear or Guilt tonight. And uh, I do want to make a few announcements before we start doing that. One is just some general reminders about the nature of the project. This is an online uh, reading group dedicated to Atlas Shrugged. We're going uh, a chapter, uh, going through it a chapter a week. And we had these weekly discussions on Tuesday nights. Um, part of the reason that we're doing this is because we'd like to get people ready for the Atlas Shrugged essay contest. You can win up to $10,000 uh, if you uh, take first place in that. I have put uh, links to the essay contest in the comments section of this post, if you're watching this through Atlas Shrugged, the Atlas Shrugged Facebook page. I've also put links to the past recordings of uh, Atlas Project broadcasts, which are available on ARI campus. And I've also put a link to the Facebook group, which is where we have our online discussion that leads up to this broadcast. So uh, lots of ways to get involved with the project if you're interested in Ayn Rand or in this book. That was the first big announcement. The uh, second one that I have is about the nature of the discussion that's been happening online um, on that Facebook group. Um, we're, we decided that we were going to start a little experiment. Now, it's maybe a little late in the project to do this, but we do still have more than a third of the book left, so I think it's worth trying it out. Um, we've been uh, very happy to have gotten some very thorough posts from some of our participants uh, in the past few months. Uh, but we have also gotten feedback that some of these posts are rather long, uh, and, and indeed they are. And we're going to start to encourage people to try to write shorter posts in commenting on these questions. We'd really like you to try to keep each post to not much more than a paragraph. Uh, one thing that this means is that you should try uh, to not use so many quotations from the books. Try putting things in your own words, I think, uh, often helps to keep things condensed. Um, you might, if you have a lot of things you want to say, still uh, write a lot of little separate posts. Now, we, we hope still not too many of them, but at least that way uh, people can take what you have to say in, in bite-sized chunks and they can comment just on those chunks by replying to them. Um, I mean, this is something we decided to do rather reluctantly because uh, some of you have written very good uh, lengthy posts and there's a lot to get from them. And so we don't mean to uh, disparage what you've been doing, but uh, it does contribute to, it does make things a little harder for people who are reading the discussion on their own to follow along. And we'd like it to make it easier for people to get involved in the discussion. So we're going to, I'll make an announcement about this on the Facebook group uh, later uh, when we post the questions on Thursday. So we'll try to remind you about this again, but I thought that we'd start by kicking off uh, an announcement about this in uh, the live broadcast tonight. And then last the announcement issue about I have is quoting. Uh, say, yeah, the issue about quoting, I mean, it's fine to have a brief quote or quote a sentence or a phrase that's significant. It's just sometimes we have, um, you know, a, a post that'll be three or four long two paragraph quote, you know, where it's just um, in particular where we've asked to like notice when in the novel something happens. Uh, so in a way, the question set up for it. But if there are a lot of posts that are long collections of quotes, um, uh, it's you know hard to follow, and it would be I think more useful if uh, the questions just said um, on whatever page this happened, and just quote the couple of you know lines or sentences or phrases that are most germane. Yeah. Uh, so if, if there's a particular passage that you think provides you know, special evidence for a view about the novel that you're trying to establish, that would be a good reason to quote. But uh, otherwise, see what you can condense in your own words. I do have one last announcement real quick, Greg, and that is that uh, we're going to do another supplemental episode uh, sometime on the weekend of February 10th through the 11th, either the Saturday or the Sunday. Uh, we do these uh, irregularly when we think that there is some issue that we haven't had a lot of time to uh, dwell on in one of the regular broadcasts. Um, and this one's going to be a little bit special because uh, we've also had a series of supplemental episodes just for people who've read the book before to discuss spoilers or to analyze scenes from the perspective of what would be a spoiler if you were to find out about it. We're getting to a point in the novel uh, once we get done with uh, part two, chapter 10, where 
many of the secrets of this book are going to be revealed, and so it will be okay to talk about these. Um, uh, we're going to have a, a broadcast um, sometime after we're done with uh, the first chapter of part three. It'll be that weekend. We don't haven't decided on a particular date yet in which we will uh, go back over some earlier scenes in the novel and discuss them in light of, uh, of some of the later material that's been revealed about them. Okay, so that'll be sometime the weekend of uh, February, uh, February 10th, uh, 11th. We don't know what day or what time yet, for sure. All right, so let me just um, say, uh, and Ben, you know, welcome back with us. Let me just say a little bit about the kind of structure of the chapter and what we're going to be talking about today, and then we'll be able to dive, to dive right in. Uh, the chapter has two sequences, like, you know, one formal division into two sequences. Uh, the first sequence follows Dagny and is from Dagny's point of view. We see Dagny uh, standing in her apartment looking out the window. This is uh, her first day back after she's been at the cabin. She heard of the train disaster. She came back. That was, um, that was what we saw in Chapter 8. Now in Chapter 9, we find her at the end of that workday looking out the window from home. And she's contemplating the city, and she's having some thoughts about her motivation. I think we're going to spend some time talking about that. Uh, Francisco arrives to resume the conversation they've been having uh, they'd been having earlier that day when she was in Woodstock, when Francisco mm -hmm. came to find her there. And so Dagny and uh, Francisco continue their conversation. Eventually, Reardon arrives, finding Francisco in Dagny's apartment. They're both um, surprised to see the other there. And there's a discussion and even an, an altercation of sorts between them. Uh, Francisco leaves. Dagny and Reardon have a discussion and have uh, sex and that sex scene, I think, is interesting. We're going to spend some time talking about the meaning of that scene. Uh, after that, they're post-coitally talking uh, and talking about what Francisco means to them. And there's a knock at the door, and they answer it, and it's the doorman of the door, the assistant manager of the apartment building, who's come with a letter he's been holding for Daphne. The letter came some time ago, but Daphne was away in Woodstock. They didn't know how to reach her, and so they've held this letter. And the letters from Quentin Daniels, who you'll recall was an engineer that, um, or a physicist that Robert Stadler had recommended to Dagny, who was working on reconstructing the motor that she had found. And he writes that he's quit, and Dagny gets in touch with him and decides she's going to leave at once to uh, go see him in Utah. She decides to get that evening's train. She calls Eddie Willers to come and help her prepare for this. We now switch to a second sequence, which is from Eddie Willer's uh, point of view. Eddie Willer's now is in her apartment, helping her, uh, taking some notes on what to do while she's away, while she packs. He notices Hank Reardon's robe in her apartment and puts two and two together. He's uh, met Hank for breakfast at Hank's hotel room once. He, he knows whose robe it is, and he realizes what this means about Daphne and Hank, and uh, infers there's an affair between them. And he then sees her off on the train and goes into the cafeteria where he often goes to talk to his worker friend. And we have a scene of Eddie talking to the worker, and that's what the chapter ends on. So as we've been doing, we're more or less going to move through the chapter uh, in order, but we're going to feel free to look ahead and to look back, seeing connections between things. So really, the beginning of the chapter is uh, Dagny out the window, and uh, thinking back on her work day and what her perspective on life is and how it differs from how it's been. And uh, Ben, you want to start us off talking about that? Well, I had, uh, there were some interesting uh, comments from uh, participants earlier in our uh, discussion group. We had asked how her kind of disposition compared in this scene to earlier scenes in the novel where she was being introspective, uh, including uh, the scene where she's looking out the window of the John Galt line, uh, and uh, also the scene where she's just a chapter earlier, the, the morning earlier, where she's uh, at her cabin. Uh, we asked, you know, basically, what's the difference? And uh, we got some interesting comments from people on this. Uh, Meg said that uh, now Dagny seems to have a kind of sense of resignation 
uh, whereas earlier she was being driven by a kind of hope to achieve a certain sort of purpose. Uh, Skyler put it as now, uh, the kind of resignation he describes is she's willing to fight for her values, but somehow she knows she is seemingly in a losing battle with a force with which she cannot contend. I, I, I like that way of putting it, Skyler. And I think that sets us up, sets us up for the next topic. Yeah. Right? I mean, we might think of, uh, there's a phrase of a Byronic hero, the kind of heroes that the poet Lord Byron would write, right? There, there's something noble about them fighting in a struggle, but it's a struggle that's doomed, a doomed battle. And we've had this idea of doomed battle even before when she and Eddie are talking in the last chapter. Um, Eddie reads off the names of all the people who have quit that maybe are the people she'd look to to help in this catastrophe. And she responds to it like... Um, the names of the dead called out in a battle where all are destined to fall, and it doesn't matter who, whose name comes first. This idea of a, a losing battle, I think, is significant. Now, what she's specifically thinking as she looks out the window, right, the city's enveloped in mist, and uh, she has this thought of, um, this is how they went, the people of Atlantis, right? So she's thinking about uh, Atlantis, and uh, New York is sinking, disappearing. Her world is sinking or disappearing in the way Atlantis did. What's the significance of the Atlantis metaphor? Any thoughts on that? Either people in the room or on the internet? And you'll recall in our promo for this um, project, Atlas project, uh, Ben and I had, a, we had some quotes from this passage and from the other passages in the novel. Uh, we had some imagery. We found a imagery of a fog-bound city and superimposed it with uh, sounds of sinking, or oceans, I guess. Um, yeah, carry on. Oh, well, Atlantis is mentioned twice in this chapter. Dagny's thinking about the fact that it had disappeared into oblivion. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a tale that's been told before, and she's uh, worried that the world is going in the direction of Atlantis and going to disappear, but then Francisco talks about Atlantis as a place that they can journey to with a the hall of heroes. Uh, yeah. and so he and he has a sense of hope. He thinks that there is a future in Atlanta. So they have very different views of the Atlantis reference. Yeah, that's right. So we've had this idea of a path. First the path that Reardon was traveling down as he was discovering more and more things. And Francisco in his talking to Daphne says, um, you're on a path and we each have to travel that path in our own way, uh, but it's the same path, and she asks where it'll lead, and he says to Atlantis, which is striking to her because she'd been thinking about Atlantis. So he does have this different perspective. And then he says, remember the city that only the spirits of heroes can enter? Why remember? What's he hearkening back to? The first of the John Gauls myths, as you call them. Yeah. So at the anniversary party, the Reardon's anniversary party, I think it was, we get the first person who says, I know who John Galt is, and it's this uh, rich guy, uh, wealthy guy who was sailing the seas and, uh, and found Atlantis underwater and sunk his ship and went down with the ship to stay in Atlantis or something. Uh, it's the old it's a crazy story. Yeah. Yeah, it's an old spinster who says this. And, uh, and then Francisco says her story is true, but she doesn't know it's true. Good, exactly. So Francisco was there when that happened. That's why he's saying remember, right? Because I think in that tale it had been described as this lost city that only the spirits of heroes can enter. And so Francisco had said this is true of John Gall. Um, that's interesting. We'll come back to some of the other uh, Galt legends later. But this symbolism of Atlantis is coming up. It's connected to the who is John Galt question. Uh, for Francisco, it's an optimistic story. This is where your journey ends, and it's a good thing, it seems. Whereas um, for Dagny, the likening of New York to Atlantis is part of this resignation. It's uh, Harry online says it's a place that inspires but is unreachable. Um, while I'm looking at what's on, uh, Ellen and Merrill agree that this, this is one of the best chapters uh, in the novel, poetic, dramatic, romantic, and a crisis in the plot. And I agree, this is one of my uh, couple of favorite chapters in the novel. Uh, 
Likewise. Uh, and Greg, I, I've always thought, well, I've recently uh, noticed that there's a lot in this chapter where th there's various uh, afterlife or uh, kind of paradise metaphors. Atlantis is, is one of these that, that come up in the chapter. And uh, we also see Francisco saying that Dagny was one of the few who almost stepped into heaven, uh, but but then didn't. There's the whole, you know, the whole discussion of God versus Caesar, which we're going to get at uh, later, I know. Uh, Francisco says that the men who disappeared are dead as far as Dagny is concerned, but there's to be some kind of second renaissance where they're to be reborn. Uh, Dan Conway says, don't try to bring people back from the grave when uh, apparently Eddie tried to recruit him to help them build the rerouting of the of the Taggart uh, intercontinental line. Um, so well, he's an interesting case, Conway, a little bit different. The, the men mm -hmm. who have left when Dagny asks that to Francisco, at this point, Dagny's back on the premise that there is a destroyer. Indeed, there's maybe some kind of conspiracy of destroyers. Francisco is a part of it. And the men who left and vanished are the people who the destroyer got to. And those are the ones who are dead, Francisco says, as far as Dagny con is concerned. Dagny and Eddie agree about Dan Conway that he's a sort of a different case. He's someone who gave up or maybe in some sense died on his own. Um, and that maybe fits with him saying you can't bring people back from the grave because Francisco seems to think about these people who are dead as far as she's concerned, the people who are the destroyer's cabal maybe, that um, they will come back. Yeah, uh, and, and there was one other example of the same thing, and that's uh, uh, Quentin Daniels who says he feels like he's committing suicide, only he uh, he still wants to live, but it feels like he's leaving the world somehow. And um, this is interesting to observe, especially since there was some uh, controversy in the comments in the chat just a few minutes ago, because somebody was uh, saying that Ayn Rand was a uh, very material, had a very materialistic outlook. Uh, and it's true that she's not religious, but we'll have to think about why all this imagery is coming into uh, the into this chapter. And, and there, there may be a little bit more of it to discuss later tonight. And with respect to Daniels, he's another interesting case because he's an, he says he feels like the letter of a suicide mm -hmm. and he's someone who the destroyer seemingly hasn't reached, right? Mm -hmm. When Dagny gets his letter, she thinks the destroyer's got him by now. This was the destroyer's moment because recall earlier, uh, as Eddie's told the worker, Dagny's got this theory about the destroyer. She can always tell when somebody's right for this, the destroyer and she knows the destroyer gets those people very quickly. Indeed, it's almost always like very soon after we learn that this is the case, someone's, Dagny thinks someone's right for the destroyer, that the destroyer shows up. So this letter, she hasn't gotten it for months or for weeks. She gets it, she sees Daniels is ready for the destroyer, but she's able to reach him, the destroyer hasn't come. Uh, in any case, um, Daniels has this, is, is not someone who's been reached by the destroyer, uh, at least not so far as he lets on. Uh, when he's writing this letter about feeling like a suicide. It's what? One week that uh, the assistant manager is having. Okay, good. Yeah. So, thanks, Iris. Yeah. It, thanks, Iris. It's, it's, um, at that point, I think it might have been four days, five days to go across country. Hmm. Um, and it's going to take longer to go across country. Yeah. Oh, for the letter to get across. Um, well, the post good. Be <laughs> Good. Yes. So, so the the apartment manager I misspoke before only had the letter as Iris is pointing out for a few days, uh, four days. But then it would have taken several days for it to get there from Utah in the 40s or 50s when she was writing this. And Robert adds, and this is a, a time when we'd expect the post office to be slower since transportation in the country is not not going too well. Um, all right. So let's move on to some other. Uh, other of the things Daphne's thinking in this this scene at the window, she's thinking that it's like Atlantis. Um, uh, I guess it's Meg who had brought up um, that, and Skylar also, that resignation is a big part of this scene. I in particular, it's an acceptance that her own values are unachievable, right? So the two scenes that are, are harkened back to in different ways uh, in this scene, and which we encourage people to reflect on, are her thinking earlier that morning looking out at Woodstock, 
and her thinking back a couple of years earlier in the office of the John Galt line. And what she's thinking about in the offices of the John Galt line is how her world seems somehow unattainable to her. The world as she viewed it as a child, the world she always wanted to grow up into, the world that when she was a kid, Francisco represented like the down payment in her life uh, on this world. And um, the promissory note of that this world was to come, and it's seeming unobtainable, unreachable. And this has been Daphne's conflict throughout. Can she reach her world? It seems like she should be able to. She is someone who has never believed in hopelessness, right? The reason she comes back and she tells Sister Francisco uh, to fight the train catastrophe, she's not going to accept fate, that, that, that bad things, that destruction, that devastation, it's just what happens to us. She's going to fight it. She's going to go on. She thinks we can achieve things. We can reach our world. And yet... It seems so hard. It seems so far from her. It doesn't seem like she's getting closer to it. And uh, that's part of what she's contemplating in her time at Woodstock. What goals can I set? What can I move forward to? How come my achievements don't seem to stick? Um, earlier that morning in Woodstock, before she comes back, she hasn't found an answer to this. But looking out at the world, she has a sense that the world is a good place. The world is a place where you can achieve and succeed. This is my kind of world. And now back at home, back having come back from to the railroad, in her apartment looking out at the world, she has the sense and vision of her own world, which she would never reach. And she says, thinking of a figure that to her represents this world, now I know that I will never find you, that it is not to be reached or lived. So that's really significant. Um, we're getting this theme of, especially with connection to a particular figure, of unrequited love, right? Her values for this world, her sense of her own world, to use a, a term Rand uses in her nonfiction, her sense of life, right, is represented by this idea of a man, a particular man, a consciousness that would be like her own and that would contain in her feeling for it the meaning of all her other values. That's what she was thinking of when she was looking out from the office of the John Galt line, that she hasn't had that in her life. Um, and she's kind of personifying the world she wants in her thinking around that man and talking to him while she looks out the window, right? And she said she's going to go on. She's been living for him. She's been trying to build his world. But now she knows she'll never find him, that it is not to be reached or lived. Not just that she's not going to reach it or live it, but it is not to be reached. Like, it's not the kind of world where that can happen to you, where you can get that. But, she thinks, she's going to go on serving him, even though she's never going to meet him, or even learn his name. She, she, the scene ends, or this passage ends, who had never accepted hopelessness, it was her self-dedication to an unrequited love. So the theme of unrequited love is really significant, but it's also there's this tremendous contradiction or tension in the character. She's uh, an unrequited love is a kind of hopelessness, right? You can't get the thing you love here, but she's self-dedicating herself to unrequited love, even though the thing she loves, the whole is, is this idea that you you can achieve your values, you can go after them. You, you're not life isn't hopeless, and that's you know, heartbreaking and uh, striking. Yeah, Greg, and it's it's not the only example of unrequited love in this chapter, the one that Dagny has for this other consciousness like her own. Uh, I won't mention the other examples yet. Maybe if, if people should name them when they see them when we get to them later. Um, but I also wanted to say that I I've heard a lot of people say that they find this section to be particularly beautiful. Uh, you know, at least in terms of the language. And I think it's kind of unfortunate because I, I probably part of the, re and I feel this way myself, and I sometimes wonder, well, is this because uh, so many of us have this attitude? So many of us uh, feel like there are these unattainable ideals in life. Uh, and we, f we think it's beautiful because we still want to go after them, uh, but we, we still can't quite see ourselves getting at them. And I mean, it's, it's kind of a tears at a wedding kind of feeling. I often think, uh, what is well, ran that a particular wrong with the world that we end up feeling this way? 
Yeah. It's like this Byronic feeling. When, when Ayn Rand was on Johnny Carson one of the times, uh, and those interviews have recently, the footage of them has been rediscovered, and you can find it up on YouTube if you search around for it. One of the times she was on right after a singer, I forget who the singer was, Possibly. Uh, who was singing, yeah, in the, the Impossible Dream from Man of La Mancha. I forget who was singing it. But anyway, J Carson asks her, that, that guy's just sung the song, or woman, I forget, and Carson then introduces her and says, you know, would you summarize your philosophy for us? And she says something, as she always says, the effect of, well, the philosophy is big. I can't say too much about the whole thing now. But if you want part of the meaning of it, it's the meaning of that very beautiful song that we just heard, except in reverse, that there aren't impossible dreams or unwritable wrongs. These things can be achieved. Ideals uh, are important and are are livable, achievable in life. So um, so why, why do so many of us feel otherwise, and why does Dagny feel otherwise? Uh, we'll have to see what Francisco has to say to her. And what does Francisco feel about it? So Francisco turns up, and um, we know a bit about Dagny's state of mind going into this talking with Francisco. We've said she's been looking out at the city. Um, she's got this attitude of unrequited love, perhaps for some man or some man she imagines that she might meet someday, but also just for her vision of the world, an unrequited love for the world she wanted, and which is something we've seen her uh, uh, dealing with. Um, oh, Dan, Dan mentioned something interesting, that um, part of her choices revolve around being worthy for this man. So you're thinking, like, why is she going to go on fighting for this guy even, or fighting for the world that this guy represents, even if it's not to be lived. And it's an important point, Dan, thanks for bringing it up, that her, the reason she gives is to be worthy of you on the day when I would have met you, even though I won't. So part of it is something about her self-esteem or a sense of, of living up to this ideal, at least internally, if she can't um, realize it externally. Right, so this is Dagny's context coming into it. The other part of Dagny's context is she had said earlier that she would give... Um, her life for another year on the railroad. Now she's back on the railroad, but there's no joy in it, right? She even came home early, like as soon as she could get away from the office. She couldn't summon up the energy to do anything she could wait for tomorrow to. She takes a shower to kind of get the feel of the office off of her. Um, she's really not enjoying her work, and that's, that's, um, that's striking. So that's her state of mind when, when Francisco comes. What's Francisco's state of mind? Now recall... Francisco, uh, when he arrived at the cabin, his kind of tone of mockery was gone. His tone of being all secretive was gone. He was triumphant. He was whistling Halley's Fifth Concerto. She asked him, that's Halley's Fifth Concerto. You know, and he's not kind of coy about it. He says, yes, I'll tell you that later. So it's not, I mean, he did, hasn't told her everything he has to tell her yet, but he's on the premise now I can tell you everything. It's just there's a lot, so we're going to get around. And he's deliriously happy and keeps getting ahead of himself, right? Um, now what's his attitude when he arrives at the apartment? Yeah. Yeah, he's reserved. He has a good idea that she's made her choice to go back, so he knows that he will have to fight her. And all the cards are on the table as far mm -hmm. as what side each of them are on. So he's very serious. Yeah, he's very serious. The, the gaiety is gone, the joy mm -hmm. from earlier. Mm -hmm. he, he had an alarm, like a kind of tragedy, when he saw her run back, mm -hmm. uh, run back in, in response to the, the news on the radio of the tunnel disaster. Mm -hmm. um, so this joyousness and gaiety and freedom that he had was gone, and yet the mocking tone the kind of has not returned. It does eventually. And... Uh, towards the end of the conversation. But at the beginning, it's not there. And what he, the reason why he says he's there is, I don't think I can stop you now. I don't think, clearly, he was on the premise that she's quit. She's quit for good. Now he can be with her as someone who's, who's quit. And um, now she's back. And uh, he says, I don't think I can stop you, but if there's any chance that I have to take it. And so he's going to try. And it's pretty clear he can't. And, uh, and then he says, as you point out, well, then, you know, Keep in mind, I'm active. He's already told her he's actively trying to destroy his railroad. He's trying to destroy all the things she's trying. Or sorry, he's trying to destroy his company, but with it, the railroad and the whole economy. And so, if you're not quitting, you know, no, we are enemies now. Um, what about her perspective on him as he comes back? 
What's different there? It's one thing that's striking to me. Yeah. Well, one thing is she knows what it's cost him. Mm -hmm. That he's always been in love with her, and he's given that up mm -hmm. for this greater battle. Right. And they both know that now. Right. And he's never he's, said it, but it's very clear. Yes. And, and he, he says, forget what I haven't said right yeah, earlier, so it's exactly, pretty Exactly, yeah, yeah. And also, she even presses him on what, what price, what, what it cost yeah. him, and that's mm -hmm. just my own concern, nobody else's. And even when she first sees him, uh, for the first time, always she's looked at him as someone who's betrayed her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now, for the first time, he looks like a man she's betrayed. Yeah, Carrie Ann, did you want to Yeah, and I was gonna, that's in the same passage where she felt like she had, was even more attracted to him now than she had ever been. So the, the contradiction that she's experiencing in these uh, past few chapters is running really, really deep. So that, that she, he should be, given the fact that they're mortal enemies of her choice uh, and his choice, he shouldn't be that attractive, but he is even more than ever. Yeah, although Dagny's always been attracted to adversaries. Think about Dagny and Francisco early on. There's that tennis match and, and every but if his expert performance and this is the thing she's gonna beat and yeah, go ahead. But that but only because they were de dedicated to the same ideal. Mm -hmm. Here they're on she thinks in her mind they're in her his mind that they're on opposite sides of the equation, yeah. morally speaking. But it's better, at least in that respect, from um, thinking he's become like a loser. I mean, he's, uh, which she can never really believe, but he's someone who, maybe he's wrong, maybe he's taken the wrong path, but he's doing something difficult that she could respect in order to achieve that path, and she's a, he's a worthy or formidable adversary. Um, now, she thinks he's in line with the Destroyer, who's the most evil creature who she wants to shoot on sight. Uh, so there's the hell of an adversary. But anyway, she's, um, so he's really, really wrong, right? He's on the wrong side of things, evil even. But um, but she's someone he can, who's formidable or something like that. And her relationship with Reardon has this adversarial quality too, right? We talked about that a little bit in our, our sex talk, uh, um, our sex session. So what is it that they actually discuss when they get together? I mean, a little bit has come out, but yeah. So one issue is... Uh, she says she can't live without the railroad. She's not going to be able to give it up. Um, she talks about what her motivation is, right? Um, her motivation is that she sees in the people around her this view that disasters are uh, the natural state, this kind of submitting to disaster. That's um, something she just can't abide by, and Francisco couldn't abide by when he was young. I can't accept submission. I can't accept helplessness. Recall just... A few moments ago, she who had never accepted helplessness it was her self-dedication to unrequited love. I can't accept renunciation, and so in order, so long as there's a railroad left to run, I'm going to run it. But Francisco's perspective on that is that what you're doing by running it is um, maintaining the looter's world. And Dagny responds, no, that's not why she's doing it. She's doing it to maintain the last strip of hers. Now, Ben, now that we've got you back again, there were some, uh, you want to tell us about the commentary on this? On yeah, the, on this book? Both, uh, both Meg and Amber in our previous discussion uh, argued that the disagreement here between Francisco and Dagny is a disagreement about a means to an end. Uh, they, they suggested that both of them share the same end and we're going to talk shortly about what that end is, Greg. Um, but that they they differ over whether you know what is the best way to get to it, and you know the thing in the way of achieving that end is of course the looters. And so the question is uh, whether what Dagny is doing by staying in the world and staying on board at Tiger Transcontinental is is helping the looters or somehow fighting against them. Dagny thinks that she's somehow fighting against them. Francisco thinks that uh, she's helping them. And uh, Meg, in particular, I think, suggested that it, does it, is there some information that Francisco has that Dagny doesn't have? She, does he know some way in which he's helping her, uh, helping, sorry, does, she, does he know some way in which Dagny is helping the looters that she doesn't know? And is it some very concrete information, maybe, that she's just not getting, or is there a bigger issue here? And, and he does say there's something she needs to learn, and she'll only be able to learn it 
by direct experience um, or by her own experience. Or something. But I'm a little, I mean, if they both share an end, as, as Meg is saying, what would that end be? I mean, especially since we saw all in the last chapter, in chapter 8, what Dagny was having so much difficulty with was finding an end for herself, right? She'd given up on the end of the railroad um, or was trying to give up on the end of the road. She couldn't find any other end. So what is the end that she and Francisco share? you want to come in? The end which they share is the creation of a world where men are producers and deal with each other as traders. Hmm. Value from value. So they definitely share wanting that kind of a world and thinking that that kind of a world is an ideal. And they both would like a world that wasn't full of looters or run by looters. They both, the kind of life that they each envision for themselves or think of ide as ideal is the same. But for something to be an end, I think, isn't just for you to think it would be nice to have, right? It's for it to be something that you're working towards. And is Daphne working towards such a world? Is Francisco? I mean, from Daphne's perspective, Francisco's given up such a world. He's renounced it because he doesn't seem to be any way to get towards it. And so instead, he's destroying his company and trying to destroy the whole economy. But it's not clear how letting the whole economy come down. And, uh, I mean, he does seem to think that someday we'll be in this world again, but he doesn't say how. And what about Daphne? How is Daphne working for a world where people are able to be productive? I mean, I guess what she's doing is she thinks there's a little bit of one left, although it's sinking away, and I can at least hold on to it for a little bit longer. So she's fighting a battle of attrition for a little tiny strip of that world. Um, so in that sense, I guess that, that would be the shared goal. But it's a hopeless battle for her. And is there really such a thing as a world of producers creating value if there's no hope that what they're doing will actually create anything? She's saying the day when the looters will perish, but we won't. Well, that's Francisco, for, right? Yeah. Not her, mm -hmm. I think. Oh, for, yeah. So yeah. Francisco yeah. thinks there'll be such a day. Mm -hmm. Well, it's unclear why he thinks it, because he doesn't. He hasn't said how we're going to get there. But he does seem to be part of some kind of cabal or something. It's sounding like, and we know there are other people involved in some kind of cabal. There's Ragnar, who also, when talking to Reardon, seemed to have the idea that there's a day coming when you'll be able to make a profit on Reardon metal, which sounds a bit, which Reardon doesn't think. And he asks, well, then, why are you going on, Mr. Reardon? What? So there's this question of what, what their end game is. Dagny, as Paul just put it on the, on the, uh, on the chat, is uh, you know, going down with the ship. What's the alternative to that? It seems like Ragnar, Francisco, are envisioning some kind of alternative for that, but we don't know what it is. And so there's not a concrete end that they could say, this is the day, here's how I'm working towards it, here's how you're working towards it, and which strategy is right. And so Dagny thinks of what Francisco is doing as renunciation, as not holding on to that end anymore. And Francisco thinks of what Dagny is doing as somehow selling out the end. I mean, they each talk about the other betraying the end, which is different than like, you know, if we just had different strategies and we were fighting against them. And yet... I don't know. Ben, thoughts on this? Well, <clears throat> I mean, you're, I think you're right that they don't, that, I mean, Dagny doesn't have a concrete end at this point that she hasn't even decided on. That was, that was the s struggle she was going through in the last chapter. The most concrete that she gets, though, at least when she's, when she's uh, pushed to justify herself, what it is she's going for is, is this, next issue that we wanted to talk about, which is the, the life of a man of ability who might have perished in that catastrophe, but will escape the next one, which she'll prevent. So very concretely, she says she wants to run trains, right? She's going to keep, the, as long as there's a railroad, I'm going to run it. And that passage comes up because Fran man. Francisco says, well, why? I mean, you wouldn't run empty trains, right? What is it you see when you think of a train? And there we get this passage about this man. the kind of man we were when we started, you and I. A man of unlimited ambition, untransigent mind. 
it'll be interesting to see what happens in getting a little feedback there. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the next chapter uh, when she actually gets on one of her trains. Uh, and uh, I mean, she needs to get out to Colorado to attend to uh, the the disaster there and the rebuilding. And we'll see the other reason shortly as well. But she's going to get on board one of the trains. We'll see if it's empty or uh, full or half empty or full of what? <laughs> Do you want to say yeah, just from Dagny's point of view, it's not too different from the point of view one of us would have today. You know, as we look at our culture, and it seems to be slipping towards more negative and more destructive policies all the time. But you can always hope that people will see the destruction and they'll come to the conclusion, oh yeah, these policies aren't good. Let's do something else. So she has that in her favor, I think. That, but that's always true. People could recognize the destruction and change their, their mind. Whereas Francisco's point of view is, is pretty much opaque to her at the moment, right? It's like, what are you doing? You know, crash the whole society, and what on earth is going to come out of that, other than cavemen? You know, I mean, so yeah. I think. And, and when I heard the, just noticed him saying that, I remembered who it is who is precisely thinks he's making money by running empty trains, mm -hmm. as because which in reality are just being subsidized by the government. Yeah, and that's Jim. Yeah, so there's so, an interesting discussion going on in the chat right now about whether or not what is motivating Dagny here is blind faith. Uh, especially interesting given the, some of the things we said earlier about sort of sort of the uh, uh, divine imagery of the chapter. And I mean, the allegation is how could it be anything better than blind faith given how bad things are? Um, Betsy replies she knows she's right and expects the looters eventually to see that. Though, you know, my question back would be, how does she know? What is her reason? Uh, to think that that she can that she can beat the looters at this game, given the way she's playing it and the way they're well, playing she, it, especially. She knows there must be some way, though, because she, she's alone in a cabin, right? And she's able to build a path and build a road, and she's able to create and produce things. And think about Reardon when there's a, an accident, right, at the mills, and he's able to fix it. And the other people, they're not some obstacle. They're just there. They don't know what to do. They're not creating any kind of actively thwarting him. When the going gets tough, when we're in a crisis situation, Dagny and Reardon know what to do. They're able to accomplish something. And everybody else just sits around kind of hopelessly empathetic. So the people who are able to create and change things and to make things happen are people like Dagny and Reardon. These other people aren't the sort that could really be an obstacle to them. Somehow they are, but it must be some practical calculation or error or accident or something that's wrong now because the world is such that, you know, problems are solvable. And uh, there must be some way to solve this problem. Daphne's really no, frustrated that, that she can't find it. But yeah, It's noteworthy that when she has this conviction that they're so solvable, she's, she's alone by herself in nature. And uh, there aren't these you know, agents who who are in some cases trying to thwart what she's doing, uh, these conscious beings who know what she's doing and and have different um, different plans. Part of her struggle here is how to deal with other people. How to how can she apply this kind of practical mindset to dealing with other people who make choices and have thoughts of their own? And she knows she's not up to that task. She knows she doesn't, like uh, earlier she thinks, a mind like the man who invented the motor would be able to solve this problem, but I, I can't. Yeah. Carrie Ann? Uh, yeah, I think the, the part of the key here uh, comes up in one of the lines that Francisco says to Dagny when she keeps hitting up against the contradictions with him in the argument says, no, you won't quit until you see of your own sight and judgment what it is that they really want. Right? She came so close that morning at the cabin. That's important. When she was thinking of the purposiveness, how efficacious she is, and she has all these great ideas, and then she sees that shopkeeper lady mm -hmm. who's, who's blocking the path. Yeah. And that's just like seeing all the cotton that she talks about, or the fog, mm -hmm. her brother Jim, right? And, and it's her in a or unwillingness to see the nature of those kinds of people. Mm -hmm. She can deal with people of ability 
she can't do it with these people. If that's all she sees and they're in the path, she just won't grasp what they really want. She doesn't, she won't understand or accept their nature. I mean, I don't know if it's, Francisco seems to think there's something about what they want that she doesn't understand, right? Yeah. I mean, he thinks, um, she thinks she's not, well, I mean, let's, before we talk about that issue, there's another aspect of it that we should put into, which is how it relates to this idea of the kind of man they're both serving. Um, but there is something there. I mean, so Francisco's perspective is so long as she thinks she could serve this kind of man of an intransigent mind by continuing to run the railroad, uh, there's nothing he could say to make her quit. And she shouldn't quit if you really think that you can serve that by running the railroad. But he says, in fact, her work's being put in service not of that man's life, mm -hmm. but of his destruction. Mm -hmm. And somehow she'll come to see that, and somehow he thinks that's related to understanding what what the people want. So um, a way to put it is, uh, yeah, they, I mean, they both think, oh yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I guess that if you're looking at the virtues or the, and the values, right, she's, she's making the integrity to the ideal in the abstract more mm -hmm. important than the fact of what what's really most important is living, right? If you're going to destroy him by your integrity, uh, maybe this integrity uh, is not fully integrated. But I'm not sure how, how else to put it. How would the integrity destroy him? I mean, how? It, I don't think she thinks she's harming the man. Well, she doesn't. But she says, if Tragert trans Tragert trans Tragert transcontinentals to uh, perish with the looters, then so will I. She's willing to fight to the death mm -hmm. instead of figuring out systemically what's going to enable the best to live. Right. I mean, I think the way she sees it is the best are dying now, and I'm going to hold out with them, and if I can keep them alive for a little bit longer. But, I mean, that's the issue, right? Yeah. Um, f they both think, well, I want to talk more about this idea of the man in a moment, but mm -hmm. putting aside the what exactly is meant by the man, this idea they're trying to serve, uh, Francisco think they both think the other is betraying it. Uh, Dagny thinks Francisco is by renunciation, Francisco thinks Dagny is by making terms with his destroyers, and that's presumably the looters. But Dagny says, I'm not making terms with them, right? They're going to have to accept my terms. They need me. And, uh, you know, so what if I have to pay ransoms, as you, Francisco, put it earlier? The only thing, I'm, uh, the only thing I want is to save the railroad, and, you know, with it, this kind of man. And what does it matter what I personally have to pay in order to do that? Whereas... Francisco thinks what she's doing is, he puts it, uh, playing a game in which they gain benefits in exchange for harming you. It's an interesting phrase. I asked online, one of the things that we were talking about is why Quentin Daniels quits, what reasons he gives. And one of them was that I wouldn't be made a martyr um, for, in exchange for having given men an incomparable value. And I asked, where else do we see that? And here's one place where we see that, uh, playing a game in which they gain benefits in exchange for harming you. Mm -hmm. She thinks their need of her and their understanding how much they need her, recall now Wesley Mouch and everyone's willing to make deals with her, is her protection. Francisco says it's not. She says, let them have what they want. All I want is the railroad. And he asks, well, you know, this is where he asks, what is it they really want? Yeah, exactly. So she doesn't... She assumes that they want to survive, and that he, I think he's suggesting here that that's not what they really want. We've, we've seen glimmers of that with Jim in previous chapters a few different times, right? He says, if uh, I can't be the president of the railroad, then nobody else can either, so we'll all go down in the ship. And uh, so it, we've seen that re pattern repeat with him. And, she said that she can't accept that about Jim right in the very early part of the novel, or else she would feel like she was going insane. She only an insane person could <coughs> really believe what Jim's like. Yeah, it's a mystery that Jim doesn't seem to be after his own interest. Yeah. He seems to hate all the people who are useful or helpful to him. He hates Reardon, though Reardon's his best customer mm -hmm. uh, and his best supplier. I mean, that's pretty weird. Um, and she doesn't understand why that is, and he finds it inconceivable. Greg, since we were talking earlier about how each of them thinks that the other is betraying 
uh, the man of intransigent mind and unlimited ambition. And also, since you mentioned Quentin Daniels, I thought it was worth asking, well, uh, is he a man of intransigent mind and unlimited ambition? Uh, and if so, what does what do his circumstances, as described in this chapter, uh, tell us about whether Dagny is serving him or betraying him? And we're going to get to him a little bit more later, but I mean, easy point is he's quitting because he doesn't want to be a martyr. So does is he, he could be mistaken, um, but that's uh, some data. And likewise, Dan Conway, uh, who's already quit and who she tries or Eddie tries to get back on the job, but doesn't want to. He but he, I mean, is a man that, of intransigent mind and unlimited ambition. In that same way, Francisco was, and why it was, right? And Daphne's view from earlier on is what she wants is a man who was what they were when they started, right? Um, but all these other people have given up on that man. Have, Francisco and Daphne were like this man. And so Francisco was part of what Daphne was trying to say, even so is maybe Daniels and Wyatt and Conway. But all of them but her have given up. And even she, in a way, has given up because she doesn't think she's going to be able to achieve anything anymore, which is why she says what we were when we started, you and I. Um, so, I mean, she's trying to fortify Daniels against giving up on the man and ceasing to be him, I guess. But I don't know. I mean, let's think about this issue of serving the man. Where have we seen this kind of... Because it's odd that, that um, they are both really kind of concrete in this image that they're serving a man. And for Daphne, it's sort of erotically charged, right? He's the, she, she felt a kind of tension in her muscles and so forth. The first time she thought of this man at the end of the railroad tracks, it's the unrequited love of her life and so forth. For Francisco, it's got some other character, but he says, the man you say we're serving, she says, you know, Francisco, you know what I mean? And he says, oh, you know, yes, and talks about the man you say we're serving. So what can we make of this idea of they're serving a man? And have we seen this kind of language before in connection with either of them? Maybe that there's to someone they're serving. I assume it's not the man. <laughs> ben says he assumes it's not the man, as in, you know, working for the man. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the... Um, where we, Well, okay, so it's the man at the end of the railroad tracks, that idea we have in, in Daphne, and that's the one she's serving, and she'll go on serving him even though... She's never named. She doesn't say it's the same one she was thinking about when she was looking out at Atlantis, but I think it's pretty clear that, that we're supposed to see that connection. What about Francisco? Have we had the idea of him serving somebody before? Robert? Well, their last night together 12 years ago in, in the William Falkland when... Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Go ahead, yeah. When, when he's talking about... He's giving her up for... Some other man. He says, help to me to me. resist him, even though he's yeah. right. Though he's right. So yeah. there's some yeah. other man that figured yeah. in Francisco's decision on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's significant. What else? Any other indications of Francisco being in the service of someone in any way? He says, by, yeah, she has, how can you do this? And he says, by my love for you, say his eyes, for the man, says his mouth. There's another scene, though. When they get together, when, when Francisco and Dagny meet a, after the John Galt line has been closed, you know, have they finally mu murdered John Galt, he asks her. Uh, and then he kind of takes her away to help her deal with it to this little bar, and they're talking. And at some point when she kind of recaptures the whole broader context of this, she asks, you know, what have you done to, uh, done to Hank Reardon? And uh, at some point in that conversation, he says, he's the only man save one, I think, for whom I would have given my life or to whom I would have given my life. Mm -hmm. to whom I have. And then he said, to whom I have. Yeah. And yes, who is that man? She said, who's yeah, the I other? Have. Who's the yeah. exception? Yeah. And he said, the man to whom I have. Mm -hmm. So Francisco's given his life to someone. He's living in the service of some man who he was trying to resist to stay with her but couldn't. Um, I mean, Greg, it's, I think it's somewhat uh, open to discussion at this point whether Francisco's just being metaphorical in some way. Uh, 
and what it's a metaphor for is an interesting question, but maybe he it's could also be being metaphorical when he talks about the man in this scene. But when he says, Hank Reardon's the only man with one exception for whom I would have given my life, it's hard to see how that can be a metaphor. I mean, Hank Reardon's not a metaphor. Fair point. Fair enough. They're doing their own, they're working in their own interests, right? That's another thing that's weird. I mean, Rand's all about selfishness. So why are her heroes talking about serving someone? That's, that's strange. Uh, and some kind of mysterious, yeah. Um, and, then, and, and maybe Ben's right in that sense that it's a metaphor. Maybe it's a metaphor for yourself. So the one man for whom I would have given my life, who I have given my life, is myself, maybe? Maybe that's what Francisco means? Maybe Francisco means Dagny by the man, because when he says, by the grace of my love, I mean, they would have to take man in this more abstract sense of human being. I did it by the grace of my love for the man, he says, but his eyes say for you. With me, that suggests that Dagny is the man, or the man for Francisco, or Francisco himself. Anyway, it's a little bit... And then um, Betsy says this man whether he's a metaphor uh, or not, uh, embodies their own values. And Dagny's man does seem to be a metaphor. Yep. Ben? Well, I was just going to say there's, there's one last uh, example in this chapter that we can't ignore. It's not a case where there's a, a man who's being spoken of, um, but it, it is a presence in the room. It's uh, not an elephant in the room, but it, uh, and this is, of course, the... Uh, the scene right after uh, Reardon slaps Francisco, which we're going to talk about more. But uh, as he's apparently restraining himself, or at least as he is not hitting back, uh, we're told that Francisco looked as if he were facing another presence in the room and as if his glance were saying, if this is what you demand of me, then even this is yours, yours to accept and mine to endure. There's no more than this in me to offer you, but let me be proud to know that I can offer so much. And now here, your point, I think, really carries because this, he's focusing on a point in the room. And he's not thinking about a metaphor. Um, is there some invisible man in the room or, 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 or what is going on here? I mean, it's a man he's picturing in some way. Now, it might be that this is, you know, like, um, right. uh, not a literal man who he's met in his life, but like, you know, you could imagine Jesus playing this role for somebody, or a religious figure, or some Sebastian man. Ah, oh, that's a really good point. Go. Sebastian Danconia, who is the, the yeah. I mean, for Dagny, Nat Taggart was this reverential religious-like figure. Uh, for Francisco, it was Sebastian Danconia, uh, he says Sebast he named the San Sebastian mines after Sebastian Danconia. Um, maybe he's doing it all for Sebastian Danconia, and he thinks this is his dedication to him. Yeah, and for Sebastian Danconia, who waited 15 years for his love, and Francisco's clearly waiting for Daphne. Uh, Although one then two it would more be clear why uh, Francisco was saying in the earlier chapter, even though he's right, uh, what is it that he's right about? Um, well, he's right. Francis sounds like it's a man. Sebastian have told him to quit. Yeah, even though he's right, or... sounds like it's a man he's actually conversed with. Um, if right. these are all the same man, um, which it might not be, especially if it's metaphorical. All right, one or two more points I want to get out from their discussion before we get into Reardon entering the room. Um, one thing that Francisco says about this man right, um, is that, uh, and Francisco is treating the man like a god here, right? We're told, um, we were taught, he says, that some things belong to God and others to Caesar. Perhaps their God would permit it. But the man you say we're serving, he does not permit it. He permits no divided allegiance, no war between your mind and your body, no gulf between your values and your actions, no tributes to Caesar. He permits no tributes to Caesar. So literally, a tribute to Caesar must mean something like, you know, you're letting the government extort you or the looters extort you or something, like Caesar would have, um, and not doing in this area of your life, the area where the government authorities or whoever, the looters have control over you, you're not doing what you think is right or best or ideal, what would be godly or what would be this manly, so to speak. Um, you're instead doing what, uh, doing what the looters tell you. 
uh, and their God would permit it. He would permit you to be idealistic or to live up to what your life's about only part-time, but spend the other time serving Caesar. This man doesn't. Okay, so we can kind of understand that. We can understand why that fits with his criticism that she's making terms with his destroyer. But how is this a war between her mind and her body or a gulf between her values and her actions? The separation between mind and body or spirit and body or values and actions, that's what we saw with Hank Reardon. Right, where like he wanted to have sex with Dagny because she represented his highest values, but he didn't know that, and he and he was having this war with Dagny's never been like that. She was like, you know, sex is awesome from when she's a little kid, isn't it wonderful? Like Francisco said, but she agreed our bodies could teach us such pleasure. She's not somebody who's like repressed and weird with her her mind and her body. It, it, on the first run of the John Galt line, she thought how wonderful. That, in what way is Dagny have a gulf between her mind and her body that Francisco's, or does Francisco think she does? that this man wouldn't approve of. Huh? Yeah, I'll carry on. Uh, well, the gulf here, it's, it's not in the realm of sex, and it's not even in the realm of work. It's in the realm of politics and slash economics, like in terms of a system. Uh, so she she's willing to die and have her stuff taken from her uh, because she's dedicated to her values. So she's living up to what's inside of her uh, and at the price of her death, Liv physical death, and uh, them taking her physical stuff that her living mind, her soul created, not theirs. So how's right? that a gulf between her mind and her body? What side is the okay, mind on? She's, she's, uh, the and side that it? the mind is on is handing over her stuff for them to take it from her to, for, so she can die. That, that's, so her actions are, she's, which is what Francisco is trying to persuade her of in this chapter. So, like, look, you're handing over the stuff for them to take your life away from you. So the mind would be on the side of keeping the stuff and the bodies. Uh, it's her body that's being taken away, in effect. Yeah. She'd rather die like that than Wouldn't, to, uh... to give up. So she's, she's not willing to stop producing the material. Uh -huh. She understands from the production side in terms of work like what it takes to create the stuff, but she's not thinking in terms of the larger economic and political system of now those people, she's giving them the, the uh, she doesn't want to stop producing the material stuff, uh, but that's exactly what they're taking away from her. Maria? Um, I, so I kind of think of it as somebody who just recently left a job that they weren't uh, that into, um, kind of like, the way that you sometimes compartmentalize things. So in sex, mm -hmm. I think Hank sometimes compartmentalized like his body and his mind. His mind was mm -hmm. kind of wanting something else, but his body was doing something else. And I think for her at her work, she's clearly not into it, but she's going to work. Mm -hmm. She's going through the motion, she's, but she's coming back. She clearly doesn't like being there. She comes home mm -hmm. early. She takes the, you know, like a shower to get mm -hmm. it all. But she's still going through the motions of the job. Mm -hmm. Like her body's doing that stuff, yeah. but her mind's not into it because she knows that she's no longer getting any joy out of it. She no longer believes in it. So I think mm -hmm. that that's kind of the break there that I see. Mm -hmm. but ben? Greg, isn't it this, uh, this same impossible dream idea that you were referencing earlier before that uh, even though she would normally reject that concept, I mean, her dream, her, her values, and, and Paul is uh, mentioning something about this in the chat right now, you know, is to have a certain kind of world. She, she has an idea of how the world should be in her mind, but she seems to be accepting and resigning herself to the fact that she can't really make that physical world in that way. And, uh, you know, it has something to do with the looters and it has something to do with the limitations that have been put on her. But I mean, her body isn't able to achieve her mind's desires. Yeah, and in the scene where she first has this revelation about this, right, which is the running of the John Galt line scene, she the, the, the train of thought that leads her to um, this issue of a mind-body connection, right, starts with she's the train speeding down the, the tracks, and she says it's a strange foreshortening between sight and touch. Something's out there in the distance, but we're going so fast, you know, soon it's, it's right there. Between sight and touch, between goal and achievement, between, and it's like a click, spirit and body. First the sight of the thing, then actually touching it, getting it real in your life. And that's, 
and she wonders whose malevolence crept through the world trying to tear those things apart, trying to make it that the things that you want, that you're living for, that mean something to you, aren't the things that you're achieving, experiencing, feeling in your life. And I think the signs that they have come apart for Daphne are just the ones Maria was, was pointing us to. Her actual life isn't the life she wants to be living. I mean, she's doing all this stuff to create, to produce, to do the kind of things that she thinks are right, all in service of this kind of vision of her world. And yet, she's not living in her world. She hates her job, that which she's actually doing day to day. She has to wash it off the office. It, her world hasn't come, and now she's been driven to accepting that it can't even come. It's not to be lived. And she's at work, and uh, she's at work, and recall, she's now acting like a business machine at work. Eddie, this is how we'd be if we could feel, but we don't feel any longer. She's listing some business thing, and all of a sudden, uh, while she's giving him instructions, she violently flings some stuff off the table. Like she's, There are all kinds of symptoms that Dagny's spirit and her body, what she wants out of life, and like the motions she's going through in the world have come apart from one another. And so I think Francisco's noticing these symptoms. And then, of course, I think it's definitely true, as Carrie says, that the, the cause of this is something about the kind of life she's living in this system dominated by the looters. And what Francisco's saying is, um, is you know, don't do this. Don't make terms with the looters. Um, all right, so let's transition to, to the next scene. Um, Dagny... Uh, it ends with Dagny, the Dagny and Francisco discussion. Dagny kind of connects it back, puts it back in time. It's not just Francisco and her have a difference of opinion, right? Francisco says, look, then if you're taking the stand, I'm going to be fighting you. I'm going to be trying to destroy the things you're out to get and or to preserve. And uh, he realizes that she's he's part of a conspiracy, he remembers. Right? Was you at Ken Daniger's office? No, but he doesn't ask her what she meant. He's part of this destroyer's cabal. That's where she asks about the men who have gone. You'd know it. Are they alive or dead? They're dead as far as you're concerned, but there's to be a second renaissance. I'll wait for it. And to that, she responds no, desperately, responding to one of the two things that he was intending her to understand. Don't wait for me. And his response is, of course, I'll always wait for you, which is a callback to in childhood when he would beat her to the point where they'd meet on the hill. Right? That's foreshadowing in a setup of for this is going to always have to wait for Daphne. And it's at this point that the door opens and Hank Reardon enters at the point when Francisco's acknowledging now openly that he's been waiting for her for 12 years and will always wait for her. And we know that that's true, right? He's told Reardon, I but loved but one woman in my life, always have and still do. And Reardon asks, have you lost her? And his response is, God, I, I hope not. So we know what Dagny's context is for this scene. We know what Francisco's context is. What's Reardon's context. Why is he here? And what's he thinking and expecting out of this evening? Yeah. He wants to tell Dagny he loves her, that ever since he signed the gift certificate as one of his two rules is meet her and tell her that he loves her. Yeah, she's the one value he has left in the world. He has to, he's going to reclaim her. One of his rules is never let her know what happened. But the other is, he, he, the one thing he wants is to come and tell her he loves her. So this is the night. And what does he find in her apartment after she's been gone for almost a month and he's finally going to get to tell her he loves her? Francisco, the guy who the last time he saw swore an oath to him on the woman he loved and then betrayed him. He, he ordered metal from him or copper from him. And he said, don't deal with yeah. the only copper. <laughs> I told you not to deal with it. <laughs> All right, so Ben, you want to start us off talking about about this encounter? Well, I mean, so one thing that we know, uh, one thing that happens is it's not just Francisco making a discovery at this point um, about, sorry, it's not just Reardon making a discovery at this point about Francisco, it's, it's Francisco making a discovery. This is news to Francisco that uh, Reardon and Dagny are together and uh, you had highlighted the exchange here about when um, Reardon thinks, you know, Francisco now owes uh, him something. There's something you have to, that must be paid for. Yeah, I mean, at, at, 
so Francisco realizes, right, he's, he's fixated on the key in Reardon's hand and looking at his hand where the key had been. He knows what it means. He's got a key to her apartment and he's entering without announcement. Um, also, what he does immediately is he's, he immediately stands up and is courteous. What should that make us think of? This is a little bit subtle, but okay. when, um, probably too subtle to ask as a question, yeah? Or does anyone that know what I have in mind? So what happens at James's wedding is James is stunned and surprised when Francisco enters. He doesn't know how to act, and he's all flustered. And, J- and Francisco says, Jim, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you need... You can tell a lot about, you need your manners, especially in times when... You your know, manners have like, never been glued to you too, too securely or something. Yeah. They always come loose in time of a crisis, and that's when you need it next. And now Francisco's in a crisis, and he stands up courteously and so forth. Yeah, and the, 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 the automatic civility um, is one of the you know, indications that he's resorting to this. Yeah. Um, he knows he's lost Daphne to Reardon, and at one point where Reardon thinks he needs to be paid, there's something Francisco needs to be paid for, or repaid for, some debt. Um, Francisco says, if that's your purpose, haven't you achieved it already? Francisco is saying, you, she took the woman he loved. And he's accepted, you know, he realizes what this is, he knows he's been gone for 12 years. He knows Daphne was saying, no, don't wait for me. Now he knows why. And later, he says, part of this discussion, you you have nothing to fear from me now. He can't take her back. He doesn't think he can. Um, So yeah, Francisco is stunned, hurt. He's lost a big part of what he's been going on for. He knows it. What about Reardon? Yeah, what's what's Reardon trying to accomplish in this? Robert, do you want to say something? Well... There's a sentence that puzzles me, and I wanted to open it up for, mm-hmm. for your comments. So it's when Francisco, uh, Reardon is looking at Francisco, and he says, this was the face of the man he loved, the man who had set him free of guilt, and he found himself fighting against the knowledge that this face still held him above all else, mm-hmm. uh, above his month of impatience for the sight of Dagny. Now, the way I read this, he loves Francisco more than he loves Dagny. That's the way I read this, but I don't believe that. So I have an issue with that. <clears throat> Francisco's is the first face Reardon sees. Uh, while he's talking to Francisco, part of what's going on is he's fighting against the knowledge that he still loves this man and that this face holds him above all else, even above his desire to see Dagny, who he's been impatient for for a month. And this implies, says Robert, that... Um, Francisco's not only that not only that Reardon loves Francisco, but loves him more than he loves Daphne, and that he thinks no, that can't be. Yeah, I'm asking, does it imply that? Yeah, that, that because to me it sounds like that, but am I the only one who sees it that way? I, mean, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, there is another thing going on with Francisco, and, and which is that there's an unresolved, really deep conflict for Reardon involving Francisco. And there isn't that for Daphne. He loves Daphne. It's simple. I mean, it was comp- complicated, but now it's simple. Um, but there's a way in which Francisco represents something to Reardon in a way that even Daphne doesn't, right? I mean, um, he's the one person he's lonely for uh, in, this, in this way that represents maybe the, a kind of view of life that... Um, He's struggling with whether it's possible. I mean, one thing, um, I mean, Ben, you had had made this point about the respect in which Reardon thinks that Francisco is worse or more harmful than the looters, and I think that's really relevant here. Do you want to come in on this? Ben, your mic's off. Sorry. Uh, especially given the point that you were making before, even uh, you know about how even now Reardon is realizing that he loves Francisco. This is the face that he loved. Uh, how is it that he's still seeming to blame Francisco for you know what he's done? You mentioned the part about how he has nothing left uh, to protect 
uh, you know, from Francisco. He's taken more the looters can ever take, destroyed everything he's touched. Why is he blaming Francisco for having lost everything, including presumably something like his mills through the, the gift certificate? Um, well, two, I mean, two yeah. thoughts. On this. One is, as Robert was pointing out, part of the context for this, he's like summoning up all the worst things he could say about Francisco mm -hmm. to fight against um, something in him that's still drawn to Francisco, which is sort of similar to what he did to Daphne the next morning. Um, but uh, he's not wholeheartedly against it. But when he You've taken everything more than the looters could ever take. And now I've lost Ben again. I don't think um, he's saying you're responsible for taking the mills. Uh, you're responsible for the gift certificate thing. I think, I mean, what is it that Francisco has taken from Reardon? What is it that Francisco had given to Reardon? Sanction. Moral sanction. Moral sanction? That's one thing. What is it more spiritually? How does Francisco des Reardon describe what he gets from Francisco and nowhere else? Mm -hmm. Or somewhat from being with Daphne? Hope. Yes. It's somebody he could admire. It's someone he could admire. Mm -hmm. So uh, someone he can look up to, someone he could admire, a sense of hope of what's possible. Mm -hmm. um, at times when Reardon's struggling hardest, right, he wants to see Francisco, and he's hoping that Francisco won't disappoint him. Don't let me down. Don't turn out to be. He needs more than anything to see that a man such as what Francisco seems to be is possible. As Francisco seems to look to this man for inspiration, Reardon seems to look to Francisco in this way. And then Francisco turns out not to be that. Everything he told them must have been BS. He wouldn't stand by him when he needed him to fight the looters. Yet he's the one who totally understands Reardon. So he's worse than them. He betrays with full understanding of what he's betraying. And what Reardon thought was possible and worth living for and in the world isn't awful as it seems to be. It's all false, and it's betrayed him. I mean, Francisco's betraying Reardon. is like the world's turning out not to be what he finally was seeing that it could be. It's something that's really spiritual, and I don't think it matters to him whether he has the mills or not, it, 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 compared to, is this the world that's like that? And so he needs to protect the one bit of his world that he still has, Daphne, from this kind of destruction, desolation. And... Um, um, yeah, Opujo also mentions he has seen Daphne a month ago, and he's confident he's going to see her again. He hasn't seen Francisco in all this time, and there's this... Um, he wants to tell Daphne he loves her, and now Francisco is like, he's yeah. there, and he's a higher value. That's the I thing. think it's just it's been a question mark in his mind. He understands <clears throat> Daphne. He doesn't understand so Francisco. Way, but also, like to follow yeah, thing. go ahead, Robert. So Carrie and I were talking about this on, on the way over here, and she attributed it to what Aristotle calls character friendship mm -hmm. as opposed to romantic love. And that's, so those are the kind of ways that we're, we're looking mm -hmm. at this here. And is there a higher, between the two, is there, is there? So I think to say more about that, we'd have to say a lot about Aristotle. And um, so well, let's, just, just like let's, let's leave that, because there's a lot else to say in that much time. Let's mm -hmm. say there is something interesting, strange going on in this relationship. And, uh, significant and say we don't know fully what it is. Um, well, so the let's finish up with this scene because there's another big scene. Um, so what happens? Um, Francisco is trying to protect Daphne from her. Uh, he, in this, is ranting about, um, about how he's not to be trusted. Do you think I believe... Francisco's saying, look, I'll face you, we'll sort this out, just not in front of Miss Taggart, I'll come anywhere you want. No, it's from you, she has to be betrayed, you're the one who's not supposed to see her. And Francisco says, what if I give you my word? We don't. Probably he's going to give him his word that he's not going to come to her again or something. And Reardon responds, well, you know, I know what they mean, your word, your oath by the only woman you ever loved. And they, at the moment, all know what it means, right? Is this the woman you love, and Francisco looking at Reardon, sorry, looking at Dagny, answers yes, it's the first time he said it. Dagny's trying to stop him from answering. And Reardon slaps him. And this is where we have this scene of Francisco taking strength 
looking at this, uh, looking at this other face um, to gather strength from it, and doesn't respond, doesn't fight back. This is what Dagny says is his greatest achievement. And there's a lot of talk about why that is, but let's just pass over that issue for now. And uh, says, within the context of your knowledge, you're right, and walks out. And Reardon knows that he'd give his life not to do what he had just done. If there's something that needs to be said, he asked Daphne say it, because he's been trying to talk. She says that uh, Francisco was the first man that she had. You wanted to know who that man was, and now she's a contestant in this fight with Francisco D'Ancona. And then we have this very intense sexual encounter between them, right? Dagny thinks Reardon might kill her. Uh, she draws blood to his lips. He's staring at her and thinking about what it would be like for her and her hated rival to be together, uh, his hated rival. And then he takes her violently, thinking about Francisco while he's doing it. And she's thinking about it. And somehow this, this really intense sex scene is a kind of acceptance or ownership over what happened for all for the two of them anyway Francisco's not there to be part of it although Francisco's gesture to her as he leaves uh, she interprets as her, his acceptance of of her choice and uh, but in this moment uh, she's both Dagny feels like she hasn't betrayed either of them but her feeling for them comes from the same place Reardon in some sense accepts it and they talk in the aftermath about uh, she says he did mean a great deal to you and, and Reardon says he still does um, Reardon knows in the moment when Francisco doesn't hit him back how much Francisco had loved him and, um, okay so now we have the scene with Quentin Daniels and the Quentin Daniels letter comes what is Daniels reason for quitting I'd ask this online that he doesn't want to give his uh a, a product of his mind to the world that, that treats him as it does, that he won't be made a martyr in exchange for offering people incomparable benefit. I, we'd asked where people where we'd seen this kind of language before. I'd mentioned a few cases right uh, online. We already saw one here. One other that's worth keeping in mind that I think is particularly relevant. We talked about one of the John Galt legends, one that Francisco weighed in on, the Atlantis one, which he says is true, which is a weird thing to think because it's crazy. Um, Francisco himself has a John Galt story that he tells Daphne, which is what? Who is John Galt according to Francisco? Prometheus. Yeah. Prometheus who changed his mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this version of the Prometheus myth, right, um, uh, Prometheus who changed his mind after centuries of being torn by vultures in payment for having given men the fire of the gods, he broke his chains and withdrew his fire until the day when men withdrew their vultures. So he's not being willing to be made a martyr for helping people. And there's one other big, oh yeah, carry on. I was gonna say, in addition to the not willing to be a martyr, he says something uh, else important about moral responsibility. Uh, this is Quentin Daniels, and this mm -hmm. resonates with what Francisco has been saying. I, I would not take it upon my conscience that anything produced by my mind should be used to bring them comfort. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's, he's throwing off the moral responsibility. He says, no, I would be responsible for providing succor for them. Yeah, so there are, two, I mean, there are two issues. These people are bad, and I'm not going to be responsible for helping them. Yeah. And also, I'm not going to be able to be, I'm not going to be made to suffer for helping them, which is the martyr thing. Yeah. And we see that's a point that, I mean, the Prometheus example, is, and one other thing that Francisco also says is an example of that to Reardon, the Francisco's use of the Atlas myth, right, which is significant because it's the title of the book, uh, if you saw Atlas, the giant who holds the world on the shoulders, on his shoulders, if you saw that he stood, blood running down his chest, his knees buckling, his arms trembling, but still trying to hold the, the world aloft with the last of his strength, and the greater his effort, the heavier the world bore down on his shoulders, what would you tell him to do? And Francisco's answer, given us the title of the book, is to shrug. Daphne wants to go after Daniels. Eddie comes to her apartment to help her prepare. Eddie finds out about the affair, revealing something about Eddie's feelings himself for Daphne. Mm -hmm. 
And so Eddie meets with the worker, his confessor, and this is the final scene, and Ben's still not back with us, okay. Um, first, why is the worker there? The worker has been waiting for Eddie. David and Amber online both commented that the worker is like a confessor character for Eddie, like his priest or something. I think that's right. And that's the significant to why Eddie tells him so much and maybe part of what his function in the story is. But from the worker's perspective, why is he there? He's been waiting. He's always been interested in Dagny. And it was known that Dagny quit. So he wants... He wants and the first story. thing he says is something about her being back, because Eddie says, how did you know? Well, I guess everybody must have known. See, he's there. It's important for him to be there that night, because he wants to find out about Dagny. He's waiting for her. What else is the worker interested in? He hears about Daniels for the first time from Eddie, and he's asking questions about that. It's the first he's learned of him. He asks why Daniels quit. When Eddie says why Daniels quit, he says he, seems, he discovered the whole secret. Daniels quit because he didn't want to be, give something created by his mind to the looters that hate him, wouldn't be willing to be made a martyr in exchange for giving them a benefit. The worker says he's discovered the whole secret. What secret? Of the motor? No, he's not found that. What else does the worker ask? He's probing about Eddie and what his personal, what Eddie's so upset about. And he, but even before that, there's something else the worker asks once he finds out that Daphne's back. I think Pooja online or somebody had noticed this. He asks, what is she counting on? We can tell that because Eddie says, I don't know what she's counting on. And before, he had asked in an earlier scene, is she counting on? Uh, who was it, uh, Sanders to make these motors? So it seems like the worker is very interested in what Daphne or Taggart Transcontinental is counting on. He finds out Ken Daniger is, is what she's counting on. He asks that, and then suddenly Ken, or sorry, um, Dwight Sanders, and then Dwight Sanders is gone. And when Dagny finds out Dwight Sanders is gone, that's when she's in this state of um, desperation back at the office, is looking up at the unattainable ideal of everything she loved, thinking about the man at the end of the railroad track. And will she ever meet him? McNamara, the first McNamara the first encounter. disappears soon after, uh, soon after he's mentioned. Uh, so, Ben, I, I don't know, were you able to hear me before the broadcast got interrupted? I was talking about, we were talking about the worker. Uh, a um, bit again, not all, but yeah, go ahead. So the, there's the suggestion that um, the worker is, uh, is asking about, uh, about what Taggart Transcontinental is counting on. Uh, he's done this in the past, and indeed uh, he's done it and then people have gone missing shortly after he's done it. Uh, McNamara went missing shortly after the worker heard about him. Uh, shortly after the worker asks Eddie, are, they, well, are you guys really counting on Sanders? That's when Sanders disappears, and it's when Sanders disappears that it sends Daphne into this crisis, which is when she uh, um, first thinks about the man at the end of the railroad track, or the first time we're told about her thinking about him, right, is what's inspiring her to go on. Um, also, earlier, the worker was... Eddie was telling the worker about Dagny's view that Daniger was ready for the destroyer. And the worker seems to say, she's a really smart lady. Because he says, you'll bet she's smart, you know, or whatever. And then Daniger disappears right before Dagny going to get him. And Eddie has said he's... So it, it sound, it's looking like the worker's connected to this destroyer conspiracy. Like he's a spy. At least we're starting to get a lot of reason to worry that that might be the case. And a couple of people had said earlier on the Facebook forum, you know, what's with Eddie? Loose lips, sink ships, and so <laughs> forth. It seems like um, uh, Ed, the, Eddie, the worker is also the only per Eddie's the only one who knows where Daphne is. And he told the worker while he was saying he wouldn't tell anyone. And then Francisco shows up. 
the reverse Jim Curley. And says he hasn't told First he tells him what he isn't going to tell him, <laughs> then he tells it to him, then he tells him what he didn't tell him. Yeah. yeah. And Francisco said he hadn't seen Eddie for years. When yes. He yes. So Eddie didn't learn it from Francisco. Or, or, or rather, Francisco didn't learn it from Eddie, did he learn it from... So the worker, it seems like he might be connected to the destroyer. That's interesting. What else is interesting about the worker in this chapter? I mean, there's the whole fact that it seems like Eddie is in love with Dagny, which I don't think we have time to really talk about, or he's fixated on her in some way. Well, yeah, he was interested and reacts violently to the knowledge. That, yeah, that she's sleeping from the tank reared in. Yeah, the worker is, is pressing Eddie for information about Dagny's personal. He knows something's bothering him. Even once he knows it's not to do with the railroad, but to do with Dagny's personal life, he keeps pressing he wants to know it. Uh, well, it wouldn't matter to you. This isn't the first time he's done something like this with Dagny's personal life. Yeah, Eddie talks about her falling asleep in her office. The worker seems to ask her how she well, why are you interested in how she looks? Uh, you're right, why do I talk about it either? So uh, the fact that Eddie's got, uh, um, got something going on for Daphne uh, is maybe, is maybe uh, part of how this worker gets him talking or something. But um, the worker seems to be really interested in Daphne's private life. I think Eddie asks her what he does for hobbies. He, he learns from Eddie that Daphne, uh, yeah, the only thing she loves outside of the railroad is the music of Richard Halley. Um, he asks about that. He seems awfully interested in Daphne. And he's pushing the worker on what it is, sorry, he's pushing Eddie on what it is that bothers him. And of course, Eddie says, and what happens? Splitsville. It's a bundle. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you, we can First gather by... Loses his cool. Yeah, but we can gather <laughs> by a, the worker's response that he's, yes, violently moved or, or upset or stunned or something at the revelation that Dagny is sleeping with Hank Reardon. He's like, oh, God, what's the matter with you? Yeah, Eddie says, oh, God, what's yeah. the matter with you? Yeah. Which is doubly odd mm -hmm. because, it, Robert, you said it's the first time the worker loses his cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, how is the worker described? As a man without <laughs> no fear or guilt. <laughs> That's one in this yeah, chapter. It, it, yeah. Looks like, it looks like nothing could hurt you, like you've never been bothered by anything. Why are you bothered? But That's why I like to talk to you because you seem so implacable, like nothing could ever hurt you. And then we get this point, why is everybody laughing, by the way, when we get when you said he Eddie describes him as he looks like you've never felt pain or fear or guilt. I don't think they should that, answer that question. <laughs> you you want to hide while they're laughing at it, even though we're over time. Well, <laughs> the big question here. I mean, you have to be careful. The big question here is is why is the worker, uh, why is his face the name of the chapter? He is just at the tail end of it and has never seemingly played a very significant role in the plot, uh, as far as we can tell. Why is his face the name of this whole chapter? Now, I mean, there have been other faces named elsewhere or discussed elsewhere in the chapter. Uh, there's a lot of focus on Francisco's face uh, when the slap happens, even before that, when he comes into Dagny's uh, apartment for the first time. Reardon looks at his face. It's the face he loves. Of course, he slaps his face. We get the sense that Reardon's, that Francisco's face is a face without pain, even when he's having been, even after he's been slapped, he, Dagny says he's uh, tearless. Uh, he doesn't seem to have fear or guilt either, but it, 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 yet this is not the description that gets applied to Francisco. It's this random anonymous worker. And there's a kind of triumph over pain Francisco's face. So it's not like he's painless. It's like he can master his pain. I mean, certainly we're meant to note the chapter title clearly derives from the description of the worker. And so at the very least, something we're, this chapter is meant to make us think about who is this worker. Now, maybe it's just 
uh, look, the chapter's got to be named for something. One interesting thing that happens in the chapter is that we learn that the workers really startled by this news, the workers pushing on what Daphne's counting on, and maybe it's just here's where we're supposed to put all the clues together that maybe this worker's not just Eddie's confessor, but a spy or an active member of the 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 conspiracy Dagny's on about or in line with the destroyer yeah, but or something. But you're suggesting there's even more still, than that. I mean, these chapter titles, we've we've spent some time discussing them throughout the novel so far, and they usually point to not just some interesting thing that happens uh, at one point in the chapter. They often have to do with some kind of thematic uh material that's stretched throughout the chapter uh and the worker b francisco you'd, you'd think that eddie would know eddie would know. Eddie. Eddie. Eddie knows. Eddie. can't be francisco eddie knows francisco could it be i mean what do we know about the worker we know he's kind of probing into information about tagger trans <laughs> He can afford an unpaid vacation for a month. He can afford unpaid vacation for a month. What did you say, Alex? He goes on vacation once a year for a full month. For a full month. Last time we thought that connected him in some way to um, Hastings, who was a character that turned up in the course of Daphne's uh, search for the motor. Um, he's interested in Tagger Transcontinental and what it's depending on. It might be that he's in league with the Destroyer because people keep disappearing when he finds out about them. He seems to be interested Dan in Daphne's online, personal life. Dan online suggests that maybe there's something special about Ragnar's face. Uh, Reardon was mightily impressed by Ragnar's face and his eyes and uh, his smile. That's interesting. Your mic's not on. No. What's the worker's name? So the, it could be Ragnar. I mean, what Ragnar looks like isn't well known, right? Reardon didn't know who he was when he saw him, so it's not like his pictures are in the paper all the time. He's a, a famous name, but but he's. Do we know that the that the worker really is a worker? I mean. Eddie doesn't know what he does. He's got menial clothing. Maybe he's some guy who dresses up in overalls and hangs out here to talk to Eddie. If he's a distract, maybe smokes he's a lot of actor. cigarettes. He does smoke a lot of cigarettes, but I mean everyone does. It's that it's, it, this is the time. What's his name? We don't know. Does Eddie know his name? No, yeah, Eddie thinks he asked his name once, but doesn't remember it. If he said, my name's Ragnar, dad is Jules, <laughs> it probably, it's kind of a memorable name. On the other hand, uh, even if you didn't... I mean, even, even Reardon didn't recognize he, Ragnar when he saw him for the first time. Well, hold on a second, because Ben's talking. Even, yeah, so, uh, okay, so um, Reardon didn't recognize Ragnar, so Ragnar's face wouldn't be recognizable, so the guy could be Ragnar from the perspective of what he looks like. Um, now... The worker probably didn't say I'm Ragnar Danistuel some long time ago when Eddie asked what his name was because, one, that's a memorable name, and, two, he's a famous pirate. So, I don't know, well, we don't know how long ago this was. Maybe it was even before he became a pirate. But it's a weird, you know, it's not like Eddie remembered he had a really weird name uh, and couldn't remember what it was. Now, Robert, what did you say about Ragnar and the worker? Well, Eddie, or Eddie praised Ragnar for blowing up the mills, anyone who was trying to produce Reardon Mills, he was happy that Ragnar was, was blowing them up. That was what he was telling the worker. Yeah, and the worker seemed interested in that fact. Like, really, that's what you think now. And we don't know exactly what he says, but from Eddie's response, yes, that's what I've come to think. Now, so Eddie certainly doesn't know he's Ragnar if he's Ragnar, but um, it could be that he's Ragnar kind of secretly. Do we know anything else about what the worker likes or doesn't like or responds positively to or negatively to? First scene that he loved Tiger Transcontinental. Yeah, That's Eddie it. thinks he loves Tiger, yeah. and he says that in this scene, yeah. right? You've loved the rare world that we were talking about it. He said he likes the name of John Goldstein. 
And that, and that Eddie responded, really? You don't sound like it. Yeah, so that's interesting. Uh, nobody likes the name the John Galtline except Dagny and this guy. But he doesn't sound, he says, you don't sound very happy when you say it, I think. That's weird. And he's pretty curious about that motor that Daniels is working on. And, and about Daniels that, working on it. And that cryptic line about, uh, which I think you t talked about before already, about having discovered the whole secret, which Eddie interprets as meaning the whole secret of the motor. But what does he know about what the whole secret of the motor is or whole secret of what, of anything? Yeah. So, I think we're meant at this point, I mean, to be wondering who this worker is and how he's mixed up in all of this. Um, seems to have something to do with the destroyer. Ragnar seems to have something to do with the destroyer. Could be Ragnar. Um, who else had strong reactions to the name John Galtline? Dagny likes the name as a kind of defiance. Jim hates Francisco. it. What is Francisco's reaction to it? Uh, something like, oh, you are calling it that. Yeah, so Francisco, and Dagny says in response to that, Jim didn't like it either. So uh, Dagny thinks of him as not liking the name. However, Francisco then riffs on the name a bunch of times. Have they finally murdered John Galt, he asks. When Dagny says... Um, why she's using the name John Galt. Well, yeah, what does that name mean to you? It means giving up and all, all this hopelessness. Well, I'm going to build a line for John Galt and let him come and claim it. And Francisco says he will, and later claims that he did, and later asks, have they finally murdered John Galt? And later says he can never really be murdered because he's Prometheus who changed his mind because he's found... Atlanta. Um, so anyway, Francisco has a different weird reaction to the name of the, the line than Jim does, and then this worker does who just likes it, but unhappily, which is weird. Um, well, so anything more We're about at 50 the, the after the hour? Yeah. So anything, Ben? Were there any last points you wanted to make about the title or face issue? Uh, that just that. that, just that it's worth also thinking about whether, I mean, there there are two major images that have been strung through this chapter. There are faces, and and there's the man that uh, both of them are serving. And whose face Francisco seems to be them? looking at in to those be looking moments. At. Yeah. Carrie Ann, you want the last word for today? Oh, and uh, Dagny's uh, looking forward to making herself worthy of meeting the man face to face. So the idea of like confronting oh, that's a good one. seeing the face of somebody. Yeah. All right. Ah, uh, anything else coming online that we should notice? Um, Francisco says he'll come get the line, says Harry, which is true. Um, uh, uh, Harry says the police don't recognize Ragnar either when they see him. So it must be, you know, there's some vague description. He's blonde and something. But so it could well be that Ragnar is in hiding in the cafe. Um, Dan Burke mentions Dr. Stadler's three students shared with Axton. What are they? Well, one of them's Ragnar, one of them's Francisco. There's a third student who's a second assistant bookkeeper somewhere. Maybe we shouldn't be thinking about Reardon and Francisco, but someone else in line with the destroyer. Dagny says she's met one of the destroyer's agents to Reardon. Uh, who is that? I'll tell you later. Uh, Francisco, clearly it is, because she knows he's the destroyer's agent. And she says, I don't know who their leader is. So she, I don't know how she knows Francisco is not the leader. I guess he says he's serving someone. Um, so there's someone else, maybe it's Ragnar, but then there's this third student we don't know anything about, a second assistant bookkeeper. We don't have his name. Harry says if the worker is involved with the cabal and Francisco tells Daphne he'll be fighting her, probably the worker knew that the line would have to be destroyed. Plausible. 
Um, plausible. One other person had a John Galt story. Well, there's two. There's the Stadler. Stadler. What did Stadler say? I knew of John Galt. He had the kind of mind that if he was still alive, the whole world would be talking about him. That man has to be dead. Yeah, he has to be dead. Which made us wonder at the time whether he might be the third student. One of the students, whether it's this third student or Ragnar or Francisco, damned Stadler when he opened the State Science Institute, and Stadler wondered sometimes if he might be right, but now he's sure he wasn't. And that man has to be dead. And isn't it odd that Stadler says he doesn't know of anybody who had the kind of mind who could have invented a motor like that, and in the same conversation says he knows of a guy who had a mind so great better than any other mind. and, and uh. A man of intransigent mind and unlimited ambition? But maybe we should stop. And Robert, what did you just say? Sorry. Will. Will, sorry. You say, Will, what did you say? I say we know the designer of the motor is linked with action. Yeah. It's never been directly said that he is one of the trio. But there is a mysterious person linked to Axt in this trio. And so there's reason to wonder how the various mysterious persons are connected. Which of them might be the same? Is, for example, the worker Ragnar? Is the unnamed student one of these people? Is one of these people the destroyer or part of the destroyer cabal if there's not just one destroyer? Is one of them the inventor of the motor? Francisco, after all, uh, is also someone we might be thinking of in this connection. He's someone who turns out to be secretly being very productive. He hides plans for some kind of machine when Reardon walks into his room. Uh, he was a physics student, as was Ragnar, as was this third man. Well, I think we could end on our who is John Galt, who is the worker, who is the third student, who are these people, and what's going on in this world question. We'll maybe learn a little bit more next time and a lot more in subsequent chapters. Ben, final thoughts? I'm starting to think that uh, effective uh, Facebook Live interconnectivity may be an impossible dream, but, but maybe this too is a uh, problem that we can solve next week, though I suspect in this case it's because of the new bugs that we just learned about in Livestream Studio uh, having to do with Facebook's API. Uh, See you all next week, everybody. Very well. Bye-bye.